Okay, so hello everyone. So my name is Jianan Wang. Uh, so today we are super excited to invite Dr. Uh, Te Zhang to give a talk in our uh, seminar series. And so this is the uh, third season of our seminar series on trustworthy data science and AI. So this is the first speaker in this season. Uh, so let me briefly introduce Dr. Te Zhang. So Tse is the assistant professor in computer science at ETH Zurich. He believes that by making data along with the processing of data easily accessible to uh, non-expert users, we have the potential to make the world a better place. So his current research focuses on understanding and building next generation machine learning systems and platforms. So before joining ETH, Tse was advised by Chris Ray finished his PhD round tripping uh, between the University of Wisconsin and Stanford, and spent another year as a postdoc researcher at Stanford. So he contributed to the research efforts that won the CMOD Best Paper Award and CMOD Research Highlight Award and was featured in special issues, including in the Science Magazine, the Communications of the ACM, uh, Best of VLDB, and the Nature Magazine. His work has also been reported by media such as Atlantic, Wired, and the Counter Magazine. So more information about his group can be found at, so as you can see, he lists his uh, group homepage on the slide, so you can learn more about his research from his group website. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Tsuan. Thank you very much, Jenna, for the introduction. Um... Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk and thank you for inviting me here. I'm super excited to share with you the things we have been working on over the years. So I think everyone here are kind of familiar with the rapid progress we have been making in machine learning systems. If you compare with where, where we were like 10 years ago, right, training machine learning model become super fast today. And also training become also more automatic and systematic. If you think about why, why would that happen? Right. So on one hand, you have the major push from pretty much all the major cloud service providers, Microsoft, Amazon, so on and so forth. They are actually pushing toward these two directions. On the other hand, in academia, you can also see this amazing collection of systems, and all of them actually focus on some of the sub problems related to these two directions. So on our side, right. So we also kind of work a little bit in these two directions. So one thing that we have been really excited over the years, right, so is really try to understand how can we further push the speed of machine learning training, right? We spent five years trying to kind of understand how different machines should talk to each other when they want to train a single machine learning systems. How can you have centralized communication or asynchronous communication, decentralized communication, or how can you do communication compression? How can you put them together? And also how can you put them into some data ecosystem like database or Spark and how to co-design that with hardware accelerator, for example, IPGA, right? So on the other hand, another thing that we were kind of super excited about uh, over the years is really how can we provide systematic management for the whole process of building machine learning applications? How can we do feasibility study for machine learning? How can we do CICD? How can we do model selection? So on and so forth. So, if you look at all those efforts, from, mostly from other people, but a little bit from us, I think it's fair to say that getting some machine learning models, given a training set has never been easier. However, on the other hand, I think it's also fair to say that our ability to really understand the training process really hasn't been proven with the same pace. If you look at the machine learning ecosystem today, understanding has never become more important. So since 2016, we run this continuous benchmarking effort to really try to understand where we are in terms of providing machine learning service on the cloud. So today, if you use this kind of four, probably four most famous uh, machine learning cloud, and then you kind of run them on some Kaggle tasks, right? So what you can actually see is on all those platforms, given the raw data that you have from Kaggle, I mean, essentially most of the machine learning platform is going to rank in the bottom 50% compared with kind of the, the winner of Kaggle computation. If you think about why do we have that gap, 
right? It is because when you are having those machine learning on the cloud auto ML services, you do not have uh, domain knowledge, right? To integrate into applications. On the other hand, the data could be noisy, the feature engineering could be lacking, right? So essentially to get a better, better machine learning model today, we kind of need to understand the impact of data, the impact of knowledge, such that we can uh, help our user to integrate those information to clean the data as efficient as possible. So specifically in this talk, I care about two different ways uh, to understand the training process. So on one hand, I have my data set, which could be noisy. For example, there could be missing value, there could be some value with noise, right? And then I have uh, a machine learning training process that take as input this data set and output some machine learning model. And given a machine learning model, I can measure some notion of utility. For example, validation accuracy, fairness, robustness, whatever. It's a mapping from the model to some real number. So there are two questions we are really particularly interested in. The first one is, okay, so given this, uh, that we have a lot of data problems in the input, maybe noisy data, right? Which data problem is most important to improve my utility? If I see my model has low fairness, right? So what should I do on my data? Maybe I should clean some data example, maybe I should acquire some more data example, but I want to understand which data problem should I fix first to improve my final utility. On the other hand, we kind of want to understand what is the role that each training example is playing in the whole process. Which training example is to blame or is most important for my final utility? So these are the two questions that we are kind of curious about. So why do we care about these two questions? Because once you understand these two questions, it can really unleash the potential of a whole bunch of techniques, right? Once I understand which data problem is most important, I can do targeted cleaning for machine learning, right? Once I know the role of each data training example, I can enable targeted acquisition or debugging for machine learning. And because of the importance of these two uh, problems, uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, the machine learning community and also the data management community has been looking at these two questions for a while, right? So on one hand, so this is a very beautiful survey paper, right? To really try to understand, okay, if you want to do data cleaning for machine learning, what should you do, right? And also Jianlan here, right, has this beautiful paper, like really try to look at influence function and how to combine them, right? With essentially semi prominence when you are doing post-processing and just inspiration, right? And also Jian has this beautiful survey to talk about, ah, and you can actually use Shapley value to uh, actually reason about data importance and what's the connection uh, of that to data pricing, right? So all of this effort essentially looking at these two questions. So given all of this, right, what is the problem? So the problem that we kind of are curious about is as follows. So if you take this view on machine learning applications, there's one problem. That is most of the real world machine learning applications do not look like this. If you look at the real world applications, they often look like something like this. So you have your input data set, and then there's a data transformation pipeline to really extract features. And then you have your machine learning model training process, get your machine learning model, then you have the utility. Well, most of the effort in reading about these two questions focus on the first pipeline, most of the machine learning applications are actually look like the second one. And if you think technically, so this feature extraction pipeline really make the analysis much, much harder. And that's actually what we are really, really curious about. So specifically in this talk, I'm going to focus on this problem. You have input data side followed by some data transformation query, followed by machine learning training, followed by utility measurement, I try to understand which data problem is most important that I should fix first. And second, uh, which training example is, is to blame or most important for the utility that I'm getting. More concretely, I care about computing two fundamental quantities. For the first question, I'm curious about the entropy or expected prediction of the machine learning model. And for the second question, I care about to calculate either the expected marginal improvement or the Shapley value. So calculating these two terms are actually super hard, right? So in, in, like in the general way, 
uh, they are actually sharply complete, right? So the general technique that we have is really to introduce a whole bunch of heuristics to have a proxy pipeline for a given real world machine learning pipelines. So we approximate the noisy data uh, as cost table, which means that you have independent noise uh, for each cell. And then we approximate this feature extraction pipeline using a positive relational algebra queries such that we have the polynomial in the set polynomial semi-ring that we can play with. And then we approximate the machine learning training process as a very simple uh, classifier that is the Kenyan's neighbor classifier. And then we put them together, we have proxy pipeline. And we try to understand these two questions for this proxy pipeline. So as I'm going to show, first, if uh, for a dominating number of realistic pipeline in real world, if you look at the proxy pipeline, we can actually compute exactly, not approximately, exactly the entropy, the expected prediction, and the Shapley value in polynomial time. So that is actually the core technical component that I'm going to talk about today. And second takeaway is once you can compute these fundamental properties uh, of a proxy pipeline, you can actually have a principal framework for many, many applications, such as targeted data cleaning for machine learning, data debugging, data validation for data market, right? And how to defend against backdoor adversarial attacks, right? I'm going to talk about how to apply kind of like, uh, like these two fundamental quantities to build such a principal framework. And the third takeaway is actually, uh, you can use this proxy pipeline to proxy many, many, uh, epic, uh, like, uh, like uh, machine learning pipelines in many scenarios. It's actually worked well in many cases. So, and on the other hand, I will also going to show the cases where they do not work well and try to give you my current opinion on where we should move forward. And that's actually where we need help, right? Okay, so this is actually what I'm going to talk about today. So specifically, I'm going to talk about four things. So I'm going to spend maybe 20 minutes or 10 minutes, depending on how much time we have, uh, try to talk about the theoretical result. Essentially, if you want to calculate the entropy, if you want to calculate the Shapley value for the proxy pipeline, what do we know what to do? Okay. And second, I'm going to talk about four different applications, assuming you are able to compute the entropy and the Shapley value. Uh, I'm going to talk about data cleaning and like, a, like like some about robustness of machine learning, how debugging, how to data market, so on and so forth. And then I'm going to talk about all those heuristics we have for approximating a real world pipeline into a proxy pipeline. Then I spent 10 minutes to talk about cases that our current approach is going to fail and some thinking about the future challenges. Okay, so let's start from theory. So there are two theoretical problems that we are curious in. The first one is pretty much compute entropy. So what is the setting? On one hand, I have my data set. Because of the cost table, I have cell independent noise, which means that for some of the cell, I have alternative values. I don't know the true value, but I know it could take one of, uh, for example, like these two values in this cell. And uh, for the other cell, I have this simple noise model. Essentially, I have uncertainties on feature. And then I pipe this into a machine learning training process and I measure the accuracy of other utility functions. The question is, what is the impact of dirty data to the final machine learning accuracy? Because not all noise matters. There could be some noise that machine learning model is very robust against. So you don't need to do anything like, uh, like about those. Uh, but there may be some noise the machine learning training process is very, very sensitive to. So we want to understand this. So before we talk about this problem, let's try to think about kind of kind of simpler alternative question. That is, when we say that you have something with uncertainty, and you train a machine learning model on it, what do we even mean by that? When we say you train a machine learning model over this cost table, what does it even mean, right? So to answer this question, let's try to get some inspiration from database theory. Right? Because we have been working on how to do data processing over uncertainty for decades. So what is unknown in database? What is uncertainty in database? How does database answer queries under uh, unknown information? Right? So this probably brings us to the nightmare of many undergraduate students in their database course. And that is by introducing a special state called null. Right? 
So in database case, right, when you have a table, there's some value you do not know, right? So you put a null value here. Whenever I'm answering kind of SQL queries, we all know that there's a kind of special rule say, ah, if you compare null with 30, right, your evaluation is going to be unknown, right? So, and then essentially, if you run this SQL query, Kevin will not be in the result. So let's try to take this as our inspiration and try to think about, assuming now I want to train a machine learning model over this, what does it even mean? So to answer this question, let's try to dig deeper into the semantics of null. So on one hand, I have a cost table, right, with uncertainty, and then I want to run a SQL query over this. What does this even mean, right? So if you open Alice book, right? So there's a very beautiful semantics. That is you expand this cost table with uncertainty and try to consider all the possible valuations of those uncertain features or uncertain values. For example, here, Kevin can have age one, age two, age 30, so on and so forth. You have this potentially infinite amount of possible world, but all of them, like, like each of them without uncertainty, you run the SQL query for each one of them, you get the result for each possible world, and then you return back to the user the sure answer. That's the tuple that's going to appear in all the possible world. And that is the fundamental semantic of null. So the beauty of this is if you take this view about data processing or uncertainty or, or, or incomplete information, there's actually, actually nothing stop you from applying the same semantics to machine learning. So this is what we, what we have done, okay? So given a relation with noise, like with alternative values for each cell, we expand that into possible worlds, each possible world corresponding to one specific valuation of the uncertainty. If you want to train a machine learning model over the data with uncertainty and also make prediction on some tuple, we do that over all the possible world, and then we observe the result. So thinking about the binary classification problem, if for all the possible world, the prediction is yes, then I grid them together, I return yes, because that's my sure answer. If all of them return no, I'm going to aggregate them return no. If they disagree, by definition, it is no. But of course, I can aggregate them in a softer way. I could calculate the expectation over all the possible world under prediction, I can also calculate the entropy of this prediction. So formally, this is what we have. We have an input relation with a known noise model. I'm going to talk about how to get that noise model later. So we have this relation. It actually defines a probability distribution over many possible worlds. And then giving a test example, the expected prediction on X it's pretty much you train a machine learning model for each of the possible world, you make a prediction, and then you calculate the expectation over all the possible world. And then if you want to say the entropy, it's something similar, right? You just calculate the entropy. So if you think about why is this interesting? So here's intuition, right? So hypothetically, thinking about the case that you have entropy equals to zero, what does it even mean? It means that all the noise in your training set does not matter at all. No matter how you clean your input data set, it won't change your prediction. That actually gave you intuitive way to reason about the importance of input noise. And if you take this view, if you think about what is the optimal strategy for data cleaning, that actually become a very interesting process of minimizing the entropy, which is something that the machine learning community and also the control community has been working on for decades about how to do this. So, but we are going to talk about application a little bit later. So what is the challenge here, right? It's a very principled framework, it's, it's very natural. What's the challenge? The challenge is, if you think about the computational complexity, this could be very, very expensive. If I have a data set with N rows and D columns, if for every single cell, I have two alternative values, this give you two to the N times D number of possible worlds. For each one of them, I need to train a model and also make some prediction. That could be very, very expensive. So here's what we know. For general classifiers, I mean, I don't really know much. Mm, it's sharply hard for, like for sure, right? And also the best thing that I can imagine is approximating UCM CMC. 
However, if you look at our proxy pipelines, if you have a k-nearest neighbor classifier, right? So after the like like after classifier, so pressing it, so it is possible to have a linear time algorithm to explore this exponential many possible roles, right? I'm not going to go to detail of the technique. You have to trust me. We have paper at VLDB this year about this. And also, if you give me a machine learning pipeline with a feature extraction component, content only map operators, right? So you can also apply the same thing. So essentially for our proxy pipelines, right? So it's actually something very easy to compute. So now let's talk about the second piece of theory that is about Shapley value and data importance. So here's the setting. On one hand, I have my data set. Uh, I pipe it into some feature extraction pipelines. I train my machine learning model. I get my measurement and try to understand what's the importance of each training example to the final machine learning accuracy. Because not all the input example matters. You could have millions of input examples, but maybe only thousands of those is the reason that you have a low accuracy, right? So this is something that we want to understand. To understand this question, we actually look at one very interesting matrix, uh, which is expected marginal improvement of each of the data examples. So here's the thing that been, uh, we have been looking at. On one hand, you have your relation, like uh, for example, like four different tuples in your training set. And then my question is, okay, how important, what is the value for the right tuple, right? So in this case, uh, what can I do? A very natural way to define it is, okay, so you give me R, I calculate my utility for the whole relation, and then I remove the right tuple and I calculate the difference. I calculate what's the improvement of the utility, assuming I add the right tuple into something, right? You get one improvement value, and that's already a proxy of the value for the red tuple, right? The larger the improvement is, the more important the tuple R to this training set, right? But you can do better. You can consider all the possible ways that you can arrange all the other tuples except the red tuple, and you calculate multiple of these improvements. Like assuming you have four tuples, right? So you have essentially eight possible ways to arrange the other tuple. So we have eight different improvement values. You aggregate them and use that as the answer to this question about the importance of the right tuple. So it turns out if you aggregate them in a specific way, right? So that gave you the Shapley value. Now you could aggregate them in different ways, right? So, but uh, there's a specific way that you can do to, to get the Shapley value, which has a very interesting game theoretical foundation, how many good properties and uh, people actually, like uh, we also have done like, like some work here, have shown that it's actually worked well for data debugging, right? So, but people have been looking at this without feature extraction pipelines, and also we have been looking at this without feature, uh, feature extraction pipelines, right? So if you give me an end-to-end -end pipeline, it's not really clear what to do. So this is actually what we have been looking at. So what's the challenge to compute this value? Well, it's very similar to the, uh, to the first case. That is, if you give me a relation with n different rows, if you think about how many possible worlds I have, right? So yeah, I have exponential many of those. And for each one of them, I kind of need to run the feature extraction pipeline, train a machine learning model, right? And then get the utility and then aggregate over this exponential many possible worlds. So here's what we know. On one hand, if you gave me a generic uh, pipeline, I don't know, actually I know a little bit better about uh, MCMC, right? So it, it, it's sharply complete, right? So you can approximate that using MCMC. You can actually have some trick, we have one paper before about how to do group testing, right? To make sure you can actually sample a little bit better, how to share computation across different samples. I mean, you can do a little bit better than a naive MCMC. But what's more interesting is if you give me the proxy pipeline that we have, so here's what we know. Depending on the property of the feature extraction pipeline, you can actually have different p-time algorithms to actually compute exactly Shapley value, okay? So if you give me kind of feature extraction pipeline only has the map operator, only like, like there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input tuple and output tuple, right? If you give me uh, like one nearest neighbor classifier, I mean, I have an n-log n algorithm to calculate the Shapley value exactly. Okay? 
If you give me like, for example, one too many joins, think about the snowflake schema, right? You have a fact table, you have dimension table, you join them together and train a machine learning model over that. If you have a nearest neighbor classifier down the road, right? Again, I have a polynomial algorithm for this. In general, right? So if you give me a polynomial in a polynomial semi-ring, as long as the counting problem can be computed in p-time, you have the exact algorithm for Sharpie value also in p-time. So I'm not going to the detail at this moment, you have to trust me. So, but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into one of the kind of simplest case, right? So just to make sure we have the understanding about how the locality of Keynes neighbor could help. So the similar idea also apply to entropy or to Sharpie value, right? So let's look at this, like, like it's like 10 minutes, something like that. So this is our setting. Uh, our input is a training relation R with n tuples. Uh, and then I have a target training example that I want to calculate the value. And then I have a validation example, S, okay? And SY is a label of S. And then I'm focused on classification task. This is my utility, okay? So essentially, uh, I want to, uh, the like the T of R, right? So it's pretty much, uh, you do the Kenyan number classifier and I try to see, oh, how many in the top K actually have a matching label to the validation example, okay? So that's pretty much kind of the likelihood of Kenyan number classifier, right? So, and then output is actually the Sharpie value using this utility function. So this is just a simplified example, right? So like, uh, like we can actually uh, essentially extend all of this like, like aspects, right? You can do regression, you can have the validation set beyond the single example. You can have the utility function as a real one, like the, 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 the classification accuracy right down the road. So, but let's look at the simplified version, right? So just to get the intuition about like how can we have p-time algorithm to aggregate exponential many possible worlds, right? So here's essentially intuition. First one, if you think about this problem, uh, there is a trivial p-time algorithm for k nearest neighbor classifier. So here's the setting. So assuming I have my target training example that I have value, and then I have a validation example S, and then essentially you can actually compute the similarity of your training examples with the validation example. And you can solve them, right? From the top to the bottom, uh, it gets less similar to the validation example. You can solve them. And then the, the tuple you want to value, you can actually, it's going to appear somewhere here, right? So, and then if you think about the Kenyan's neighbor classifier, so one realization is, assuming I have n examples in my training set, there's only n choose k number of possibilities for the top k, right? So for example, you could have top k like this. The top one is the second tuple, you have top, yeah, so yeah, so, so like something like this, right? So um, you only have polynomial number of these cases. And then if you think about, assume you are doing three, uh, like three nearest neighbor, okay, k equals three. Everything after top three, doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter those, whether those things is in your possible world or not. They don't matter because they will never show up in my, in my top three, right? So essentially you can actually just count them and just add them into uh, like, like, yeah. So you're going, to, you're going to enumerate all those possible worlds, right? So essentially you only need to reason about this. You can enumerate all the possible top K which have exponential uh, like, like polynomial many of those and then you aggregate them. So this gives you kind of a simple polynomial time algorithm, right? So it is actually uh, pretty natural, but the question is, can we do better, right? So it turns out, yes, right? You can do way better than this polynomial algorithm, right? The high level intuition is uh, you can have a very e efficient dynamic programming process that you assume, okay, so this is the value for the, for the least similar training example to my validation example. And then you do recursion from the bottom to the top uh, given the value of the tuple ti, right, uh, you can actually reason about ah, what's the value of uh, of t uh, i minus one, right? So you can actually derive something, right? So and then at the end of the day, uh, when you write down the whole dynamic programming thing, right? So the whole thing is kind of very simple, right? So you just solve everything together, do a single pass 
from the bottom to the top, then you get the exact Sharpie value for every single tuple. Okay, so it, so 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 technique is a little bit more engaged than this. There's a very interesting combinatorial term to compute, right? But uh, but you you get the intuition about how the whole algorithm is going to work. So essentially, right? So the result that we have is when you have a map pipeline, when you have the Sharpie value or Kenyon's neighbor proxy, right? So a single pass of sorting is actually enough, but you can actually do even better than that. You don't even need to have the dependency on n that's as linear. So essentially, right, you could have some index over your training set. So such that given a validation example, uh, you can return essentially the top M uh, kind of most similar training example. Assume you give me this, you can also have some approximation and to make sure I can use this high dimensional index in database to compute my Sharpie value. Okay, so I'm a little bit different from most of the what data index is going to give you, uh, but that's possible. Okay, I mean, I mean, you can have something that is sublinear like to the number of example under certain conditions as a function of the right contract, so on and so forth. I'm not going to detail, but but this is also possible. Like when you have a high dimensional index for database, uh, you can also use them to compute to like not compute to to approximate the Sharpie value. Okay, so this is all the theory. Okay, I'm not going to talk more about theory. So let's talk about essentially how to use those. Assuming we can compute the entropy of a pipeline uh, over noise, assuming we can compute the Sharpie value. Okay, once we can compute the two fundamental properties, how can we actually use them? So I'm going to talk about four different applications. So the first application is data cleaning for machine learning. So here's the setting. I have a data set that's not clean. So, but I assume I know a noise model. For each cell, I have uncertainty, I have alternatives. And then I have a cleaning oracle. I can actually ask a human to say, okay, look at this cell and tell me which one of this alternative value is the right answer. Assuming I'm able to do this, uh, assuming I'm able to do this, but also assume this is also pretty expensive. I want to minimize this effort. I have a machine learning model over this noisy data set, I get accuracy. The question is how should we prioritize which cell to clean? So that's a problem that we are kind of want to look at. So essentially the whole idea is we should clean the example uh, to minimize the expected entropy. So that is the idea. So, and then this allows us to use the result of decades of research on sequential information maximization for entropy minimization. Okay, and it actually works well. So this is actually some very simple result. Uh, X access is actually how many example that you clean. And the y axis essentially the improvement uh, of the accuracy is right now it's kind of normalized in some way. Um, and then essentially the higher the better. So as you can see, uh, once you kind of clean the data in a way that minimizes the entropy, it's actually, you, um, you have the improvement way faster than kind of picking a random cell to clean. Okay, so I'm not going to the detail, right? But uh, more results like I did in this paper. So why does this work, right? So here's our high level view. So you essentially think about a noisy data set, right? So that actually gave you a whole bunch of possible world, each one of them corresponding to some valuation of your noise. And just somewhere in the middle, there is the ground truth possible world. This is the unknown data set with all the value as clean value. Okay, it's, it's that amazing possible world, but you don't know where it is. It's buried within this ocean of all the other possible worlds. Whenever you clean it, what is the process, right? So the consequence of cleaning is pretty much to say, okay, now I know this cell has value, for example, five, that's a right value. You are going to have a whole bunch of possible world that's not consistent with the true value. Then so you can actually get rid of those, right? Then you kind of shrink the space into fewer amount of possible world. You keep doing this, at the end of the day, you are left with a collection of possible worlds with entropy equal to zero. You can always achieve that because in the worst case, you can clean all the values, then you get a single possible world that's gonna have entropy equal to zero. But you often you don't need to do that. So at the end of the day, you are going to reach in a state where I only have those possible world, they are consistent on my validation side. Okay, so that is when you achieve that, you don't need to clean anymore because no matter what you clean, 
you will never change the accuracy. So if you take this view on data cleaning for machine learning, so essentially data cleaning becomes how to find the cleaning operations for each step such that you can decrease the final entropy as much as possible. If you phrase data cleaning for machine learning in this way, you can actually use the decades of study of information uh, maximization, right? Under mild technical condition, uh, you can greatly pick the next cleaning operation that decrease your expected entropy. This gives you something under some condition an information theoretical optimal way to do this process. There are a lot of interesting studies over, over the last decade for this. And if you take this view for data cleaning, you can actually use them. So second application, uh, is actually how to defend against backdoor attacks. So this is actually a very interesting phenomenon in machine learning that people have been very excited over the years, uh, it, like especially in machine learning community, also the security community. So I have a training set, which is clean. And then I add some pattern, some adversary party, give me some training example with some pattern. Here's the triangle and also flip the label. So this is the dog with a pattern, but I call it a cat. And then if you train a machine learning model over this, you essentially have the triangle as a backdoor in the model. Essentially in the test time, if you gave me a, a test example without a pattern, I'm going to give you a, a wrong, uh, so like, like the right answer. If you give me a test example, like uh, kind of in the other case, with this very small triangle, often the case, the machine learning model is going to give you the wrong prediction because it's going to focus on this pattern itself. So the fundamental question is, okay, given that we know machine learning model is kind of uh, vulnerable to this type of attacks, how can we make our training process robust to this type of attacks? So the high level idea for this is, okay, we could inject Gaussian noise to the training site to have a distribution. And then I compute the expectation of my prediction. And I use that uh, as the training process itself. So it's not a single machine, uh, it's not a single machine learning model training over one test set. It's actually, you have a whole bunch of noisy data sets and then you compute the expectation. Intuitively, right? So very similar how uh, people do differential privacy, right? But this can actually give you a certification on robustness, similar to how people are doing random smoothing for invasion attacks, okay? So, and this actually can give you something very interesting to our best knowledge to give you the first or one of the first at least uh, robustness certification for the backdoor attacks. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So essentially, it's actually inspired by the seminal work a couple of years ago by Zico, right? Uh, and his students uh, on random smoothing, but we kind of significantly generalize it. We look at this function, that is uh, I compute the expectation of some function where Z is drawn from some distribution, right? Uh, and if you look at this, what can we say about the robustness of this function G, which is the expectation, right? So if you have GX and you have GX plus delta, right? What do you have? So essentially, given this setting, you can actually have some theoretical result to give you the kind of try to bound the value of G X plus delta, given the value of G X. Okay, so you can actually bond the robustness of the function G, uh, given some input uh, perturbation delta. So we are not going into detail, but just trust me, right? We are able to do this. Uh, to do this. So how can we use that? Right, you can actually use this to defend against backdoor attack. So here in this case, right, your X is your training set, your input training set, and your Z is the injected Gaussian noise to the training set. And your fx is a process that you train a model on the training set x plus z, right? So your, your original training set plus the noise, and then do inference. This is essentially the expected uh, expectation. So if you take this view, right? So you can actually combine this with the theorem to have some certificates, right? So it looks like the following. As long as the attacker introduces a perturbation delta, right? That's not too large. The inference result will not be changed by this much, right? So that's a certificate. So for a general classifier like deep learning, like, like, like deep neural networks, you need to sample a whole bundle of training set, train a model for each, aggregate. 
But because we know how to compute this for the proxy pipeline in P-time, right? If you have a k-nearest neighbor classifier, you can actually compute this term exactly in polynomial time. Okay, so that's a connection between the application and also the fundamental theorem that we have. So this doesn't need to be classical, right? So you can, because we only care about the expectation, right? So it can also apply to some quantum systems, right? You can take the view that X is actually the input states of some like quantum computer, right? For example, you have n qubits uh, and F is the quantum circuit, right? And then when you do the measurement, you are actually essentially doing uh, this expectation. If you take this view, you can also certify the commutation from quantum computer, right? So in this case, as long as, right, so the perturbated state have a fidelity higher than something, you can actually certify the result won't be changed by this much, right? It's, it's actually a lot of fun, right? But for quantum computer, you, you don't need to inject noise because that noise is actually inherent in the probabilistic nature of the quantum system. You can also do this for classical setting, right? So you can actually take this view like, okay, I want to do joint inference or I have a query, for example, in probabilistic database. So you can actually certify some of the neural symbolic systems, right? So here X could be the output of some neural networks or some probabilistic databases. Uh, your Q can be some joint inference components, either a SQL query in probabilistic database uh, or maybe a conditional random field or maybe a macro logic network field to do knowledge integration. Right, so like in, like in the process to do joint inference, if you take if you take this view, right, you can also certify you're able to certify the robustness of this end-to-end -end neural symbolic system, right, which is also a lot of fun. Right? So, but again, right, if you think about robustness and data cleaning, right, so they are all naturally connected to entropy and expectations. So once you are able to approximate or once you are able to compute those, right, so you can actually apply them into this principled framework. So right now we kind of know, we know a little bit about how to do that for the proxy pipeline, right? With, with a, a kind of feature extraction pipeline with all the map operators and followed by the Keynes neighbor classifier, but whatever advancement that we could do in the future, right? By the community actually, right? So we really need the help here. We don't know how to proceed at this moment, right? So whatever technique that you could have to approximate these two fundamental quantity is going to have a profound impact on robustness and also data cleaning for machine learning. That's our belief. So let's talk about another two applications. Right? We got a lot of fun. So here's actually about data debugging. So here's a setting. I have a training set with incorrect labels. For example, here I have a cat image, but I have a label as a dog, right? So on and so forth. I pipe them into the machine learning training process. I calculate the accuracy. What I'm interested in is actually the following. How can we find out those training examples with the wrong label? How can I debug it, right? So the high idea is that, okay, so if you have a data example with an incorrect label and if you calculate the Shapley value, right? So this should have a small or often negative Shapley value, right? Because they have the wrong label. Removing them highly likely will improve my accuracy, right? So if you take this view, you can actually sort all of the training examples by their Shapley value. And then you just go through those with negative Shapley value, for example, right? So that can give you candidates for those like examples with the wrong label. So, and we know if you have a kind of a machine learning pipeline with only map fork operation, if you have Kenya's neighbor, right? So the proxy pipeline, you can actually do this process in n log n time. It's kind of orders of magnitude faster than doing MCMC on the original pipeline. Okay, and you can actually have like 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 for like like, like if you have a hundred thousand examples, I mean calculating this like like faster than a single second, you can have this kind of almost real time experience for data debugging, and it actually works. Okay, so the x axis here is actually uh, I go through those data example with negative Shapley value one by one, right, and then I can fix the label. Uh, the y axis is the accuracy uh, of the given machine learning pipeline. So not the proxy pipeline, but the, but the real one, okay? But when I do in the Shapley value, I'm using the proxy pipeline. So as you can see, right? So if you do that randomly, yeah, you can get better and better, right? But if you use Shapley value from the proxy pipeline, you can actually get kind of way faster improvement than just randomly flipping those labels. Uh, and uh, like, uh, so here, essentially, if you do MCMC, pretty much you get the same thing. 
right? So essentially the proxy pipeline actually works pretty well, right? To really approximate the Sharpley value here. So another example for data debugging is also related to backdoor attacks. Assume you have a training set and there is some backdoor patterns here's on the cat. And then I flick the label, I train a model here, right? So fundamental question, okay, how can we find out the training example with backdoor patterns? So kind of idea is similar, right? So our expectation is if you have a data example with the backdoor labels, they should have a small or negative Shapley value. So I can do the same thing, right? I can compute it uh, using our proxy pipeline very efficiently, right? Uh, and then it actually works pretty well. So here, essentially, we go through those examples with negative Shapley value, and then I fix the label, okay? So as you can see, the robustness, the y is the robustness of the original pipeline, right? If you do the Shapley value, it's also improved really rapidly, right? And uh, if you use the k nearest neighbor as a proxy, it doesn't really matter, right? It, and you get the same thing as a very expensive MCMC process over the original pipelines. So it could be useful for data debugging. So essentially, if you look at expected model improvement and Sharpie value, right, it could give you a principal framework for data debugging. So right now, we know how to do that for certain type of pipelines, certain type of proxy models, but whatever advancement the community can, can have to further approximate or compute these two fundamental quantities is going to help us to go a really, really long way in data debugging. So that's our current belief. So another application that we can do, given what we know, is actually try to build a data market. So this is something we have been working on for, for years. Uh, essentially, here's a setting. So you have a whole bunch of users. Each one of them contribute some data set. And then you have a data market uh, with a trusted storage, uh, such that people can actually contribute the data without worrying the data get leaked, right? And also has trusted computation. And then, if you aggregate all the information into this market and someone come in to say, okay, I want to buy, I want to buy data. What does that even mean? Okay, I give you maybe $100. And then I say, okay, train machine learning model over all the data set and then give me back the model. So that's the contract. So the fundamental question uh, that we want to understand is once you have this data market, how should we fairly distribute the money that the customer has back to the data contributor. For example, if some contributor have really high quality data, right? So they should be uh, rewarded more than some other user without this high quality data, right? So like, what can we do, right? So in this case, so we actually look at this data valuation or data pricing problem a long time ago, back in 20, 20, 2017, something like that. Uh, that's actually why we look at Sharpie value originally, right? So we have some paper that you can actually compute that. Uh, in P time for Keynes neighbor, you can actually use that proxy for, for data market, right? So it can have really efficient algorithms for data pricing and data evaluation. And here, whatever advancement that we have here, right? So now we know how to do this for end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. So, and this actually, uh, we have two data markets uh, that we are building right now. So let me show you this video. Um, so let, so I'm not sure whether you can hear the, the sound. Let me play it. Give me a minute. Ecosystem restoration is gaining momentum at an international volume as one of our primary responses to climate change and biodiversity loss. Already, millions of new trees are growing all over the world. But until now, We've been restricted in our ability to monitor and review the success of reforestation projects. Improved ground data will not only enable scientists to better evaluate forest restoration methods, it can also be used as evidence of restoration progress and in time could directly translate into payments for ecosystem services. Unfortunately, collecting forestry data is slow and expensive. But what if it was possible to share data on tree growth at the touch of a button? We allow users to share data about the species of the tree, its biomass, the carbon sequestered, and a whole host of other tree traits in a matter of seconds. And all you need is a smartphone and any card from your wallet. But first, we need your support. 
started to finalize the app. We need some training data. Training data is a learning basis for the computer models that will power the app. The more on-ground training data we have, the more accurate the app will be. And it's this simple. Now hold the app and log in. Stand in front of your tree and hold a standard sized wallet card in front of the trunk, touching the bark. This should be about 1.3 meters from the ground, making sure the entire wallet card and edges of the tree trunk are visible. Take a photo. Once you have a clear photo, using a tape measure, record the circumference of the part of the trunk you just photographed. Enter the circumference into the app and search for your species in the list. Take the first tree. Repeat this from up to three different angles around the tree. Move on to the next tree and repeat for as many trees as possible. At the end of each session, find some stable internet and upload all of your pictures. And that's it. Once we have enough of this data, the app will be up and running. Then, all that you'll need to monitor trees in the future is a smartphone and a wallet card anywhere in the world. TreeCap presents an opportunity to revolutionize forest restoration, enabling more effective restoration strategies while ensuring tree owners are recognized and rewarded for critical work they are doing. Yeah, so I can so I, as you can see, right? So it's so um, this is actually one data we, uh, we are building, right? So where everyone that take a picture of a tree, right? So and then you know, we can train some machine learning model to really understand biodiversity, diversity, right? And also hopefully try to contribute to uh to some climate problems, right? So and also there's another data market that we have together with Berkeley and also Stanford Hospital, right? To try to understand how can we do this uh for essentially some type of legislative medical record, right? So you can actually see the product carol here. Okay, so now we have uh, eight minutes left, right? So let's talk about two things. The first one is, I give you this really simplistic view about how to compute the entropy and the Shapley value, right? For the proxy pipelines, right? So how can we get that proxy pipeline given a real world machine learning pipelines, right? And second, what are the failure cases that we don't know how to deal with, right? Hopefully we can get help from everyone here. So the first heuristics, how can we get the noise model for the cost table, right? So here I have input data without noise model. Uh, how can we translate that into something with a noise model, right? So here we have a simple heuristic to say, okay, so I have a collection of state-of-the-art automatic data cleaning tools. I run all of them. I take their value as a candidate value, and then I take a uniform prior over that. It's as simple as that. So this is our current way, essentially try to come up with a noise model, given your noisy input data set. So the pipeline part is actually more interesting. That is, uh, if you look at real world machine learning pipelines, uh, they are often contains a diverse set of transformations, uh, but different operators largely fall into essentially four different types. So there are those operators like, like, like uh, remove stop word, right? Tokenization, those operators, uh, that pretty much a map operation, right? So take a input, do some transformation, you have the output. So there are some operators that have the map reduce pattern, for example, normalization, right? You compute the normalization factor, then you do a single map operation, the whole bunch of those. And then there are some operators which kind of like fork, like data augmentation, right? You have one input example, you output multiple of those. Uh, so there are some of them related to join. And for example, you have dictionary lookup. The dictionary is one relation, the input is one relation, you, you do a lookup, right? So if you can handle these four different type of operators, you can pretty much handle many of the real world machine learning pipelines. So the fundamental uh, challenge is the reduce operator that we don't know how to deal with. But luckily, many of the reduce functions are kind of relatively stable with respect to the removal data examples. So one heuristic we have is we run the machine learning pipeline on the whole data set, and then we fix the reduce part. For example, for normalization, we calculate the constant over the whole training set, uh, and then we just fix it. Uh, and then this normalization operator become a map operator. If you take this view, you can actually uh, have the correspondence between machine learning pipeline to a positive relation algebra queries, which is very interesting. So assume you have the normalization operator, you have input, you have output. If you ignore the computation of the constant, right? So pretty much if you have the input annotation activate that for those three tuples, 
right? So you can have the corresponding polynomial in the semi ring, right? So it's the one to one correspondence here. Uh, if you have this kind of data augmentation, right? You can also have a very, very easy correspondence. For example, the input x, that tuple, uh, become two tuples after augmentation, right? You can have the polynomial look like this, so on and so forth. If you have a dictionary lookup, right? So you can actually say, ah, so this is actually equivalent to have a drawing, right? You have this, where the right hand side is a dictionary, right? So, and the polynomial actually becomes something like this, right? So, once you do this, you can actually translate a machine learning pipeline, just ignore the, the reduced part, become a positive relation algebra queries. And that's actually doesn't fit into our theory. So, how many pipelines can we uh, handle, right? So, we actually work together with Microsoft to look at half a million real world machine learning pipelines. You can see a paper here. Uh, what we found out is the majority of those pipelines actually fit into the Mac, uh, Mac pattern after you do the condition and trick. So the X axis is actually set of pipeline, Y axis is actually how many pipeline we have. So the only thing that we do not know how to handle that is do not fit into the Mac fork uh, pattern is this very small green region. All the other things we know how to do the proxy pipeline uh, essentially uh, in P time. So and we will do data market, introduce additional fork, we will do a data augmentation, introduce additional fork. So now let's talk about some cases that we don't know how to solve, right? So this is actually one case that we failed. So here's the setting, actually very interesting. So I have an unbalanced data set. For example, I have some uh, underrepresented group, right? So, and then I train a machine learning model, the result will not be fair. So the question is, okay, how can we identify those overly representative examples such that we can remove those, right? So the high level idea is to do Sharpie value, right? So if you compute the Sharpie value, of those already represented uh, data examples, they should have really small Sharpie value, right? So that's the expectation. So here is actually interesting. So this idea works, okay? But our Kenya's neighbor proxy doesn't. The conditioning uh, kind of uh, heuristic to remove the reduced part works, but Kenya's neighbor thing doesn't, okay? So here's the result. If you do the random uh, removal, you get this. If you do the uh, KN sharply, you have this. If you just do MCMC, right? So you have something like this. As you can see, there's a huge gap between the Kenyan's neighbor proxy and the sharply value of the real pipeline. So if you think about why, right? So essentially the Kenyan's neighbor uh, classifier capture more uh, of a local structure, right? So because I only have to uh, look at the neighbors, but here the problem is actually more populational, right? So by approximating a machine learning model into a Kenyan's neighbor classifier, Essentially, you are missing those populational structures that essentially we have no idea how to deal with this. Yeah. So the second part is about entropy and also data cleaning for machine learning, right? So here is kind of very natural, right? So assuming you have some machine learning model uh, that's very robust noise, what if, what if they are trained in a differentially private way, right? So in this case, of course, approximating them using Kenyan's neighbor will not work because they have different sensitivity to noise, right? So this is also another case that we have no idea how to deal with, and we really need the help here. So this is actually the three takeaways, right? So now in the last one and a half minutes, let me tell you some interesting technical challenge that we are very excited about and really want to get help from everyone here. So one question that we don't understand is, we believe computing uh, entropy and the Sharpie value is the principal way to look at these two fundamental questions. Here, right, so we are kind of approximating the feature extraction pipeline using some positive relational algebra queries. But the fundamental question that bothers us is we don't really understand what is a pipeline. Seriously, we, we don't know what that is, right? So we don't know how to talk about uh, to, to how to talk about it. We don't know how to reason about it. And that is what I'm not happy about, about our existing work. That is, uh, we don't know what a pipeline is, okay? So what do I mean by this? In good old day, when we talk about SQL queries, and we have a very beautiful way to talk about what is like, like, like what, like what are they, right? So they are polynomial in the same array. There's a whole bunch of axioms for positive relation algebra, and then I derive, okay, it must be a polynomial here, right? It's beautiful. When you have negation, have aggregation, yeah, I mean, it gets more complex. But again, I know how to talk about them. I know what they are. They are polynomial in something. If you think about feature extraction pipelines, right? We don't know what that is. Yes, you can model it as a data flow graph, but can we go a little bit deeper, which I have no idea, right? 
So the, another fundamental question is actually, what is not a feature extraction pipeline, right? Are all the data flow graph feature extraction pipelines? Or maybe we only care about the subset that we can reason more about the logical structure there, right? What is the axiom to describe those feature extraction pipelines that we care about? And also, what is the algebraic structure, right? It's not a semi-real anymore, but what is that structure to allow us to reason about the property of a pipeline? We have no idea about those. And also in our work, we heavily rely on proxy models, right? But then what is a good proxy, right? We see cases where it is going to fail, right? When you do the cost table, you are actually ignoring those dependencies. Maybe we should do C table, maybe we should do PC table, right? How to reason about or approximate the noise model? We have no idea, right? But now you are approximating the machine learning pipeline feature extraction part into a uh, polity relation algebra query, and you lose all the computation. I, fi I fix the reduced part. Right, so what can I do? Right, uh, whenever I'm doing the Keynes neighbor classifier as a proxy, I lose my global population structure. What should I do? We don't know what a good proxy is. We also don't know what a good metric is. Right, so here we rely on entropy and Shapley value and mar uh, expected margin improvement. They're as principal as it can get. But on the other hand, as you can see, they're also very slow. The only reason we need the proxy model is because they are really so slow, right? Can we have alternative metrics, right? So maybe there's some gradient-based perturbation metric we can do to, instead, of a, instead of entropy, right? Maybe we can have leave one out, maybe we can do influence function, maybe we can have the expected influence function, right? So what are the alternative metrics that you should, I mean, that you should use to really approximate these two fundamental quantities? We still believe these two are actually what you need for these two tasks, right? But on the other hand, we also need to have some approximation, some heuristics, right? To approximate them, to make sure it's faster to compute, right? Without using a proxy pipeline, right? Or maybe make some other type of proxy easier to compute. What we believe is we need to understand the relationships, right? So before we try out heuristics, we come to understand what are the things they are really approximating, right? So this is also another thing that we find fascinating. We are currently working on it, but we need help. We need more people to look at this to help us. So this is all I have for today, right? So uh, again, this is something that we have been working on for years. Uh, it won't be possible without our amazing collaborators, but of course the real hero is our students who do the real thing, right? So this is like a product called Datascope today when, what I'm talking about. It's actually a very small, and not that very small, but, uh, but a small component within a larger system called ESML, where we re really try to look at different processes of ML ops and ML dev. Right, how to make them easier, how to make them systematic, how to give people like software engineering principles for developing machine learning applications. Uh, if you are curious about it, you can actually like, go to the website. Uh, another chunk of relatively independent work my group was doing, essentially how to do distributed, uh, distributed learning in different data ecosystems. Right? If you are curious about them, there's a, like an umbrella product called ZipML, right? so that has our effort there. So that's all I have for today. Again, thank you for your attention. Sorry for this very long one hour talk. Right? Um, it could be exhausting. Right? Uh, but thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer whatever question you guys have. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you very much. So this is a really, really exciting talk. So one thing I want to mention is it's already 2 AM in Zurich to accommodate <laughs> to our time. So, so to stay up uh, in Zurich. Okay, so is there any question? Feel free if you, uh, uh, you can either put a question in the chat box or you can unmute yourself, uh, ask the question to Tzu directly. Hi, Tzu. Yeah, uh, DJ Pei. Yeah, thank you so much for the very exciting talk, uh, uh, very inspiring. And indeed, it also uh, brought me back to uh, over 10 years ago, we worked on the uh, possible words, probabilistic uh, data, yeah. and your advisor uh, at that time was also very active in the uh, area. So, yeah. Uh, one in, because you talk about possible words, uh, one drawback uh, we all know about possible work, or, or I should not say drawback, one challenge is that um, it is easy to calculate the expectation. However, the expectation only happens with very tiny, tiny probability. And the variance yeah. of the, uh, you know, uh, the 
the variance of the possible possible words is really the uh, uh, challenge in using yeah. the possible word semantics. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Oh yeah, so that's a very, very good question, right? So, so here's what we know, right? So I think there's expectation. Uh, that's why uh, if you want to do data cleaning for machine learning, uh, it is the entropy that matters, right? So entropy actually measures essentially, uh, I mean, it's not variance, right? But also uh, have some uh, characteristic of the, of the tail, right? So, mm -hmm. and also I think if you want to calculate the variance at least on cost, uh, on cost table, right? If you have Kenya's neighbor, uh, I think that's also in P-time. Yeah, we are confident we can actually also have exact algorithm for variance too, right? And then you can actually treat data cleaning for machine learning as a process of minimizing the variance, right? So, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I agree variance is very important. Uh, expecting itself is not enough, but I think we can also ca compute that, right? So that's why we look at entropy, but we can also look at the variance that should also work, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, following up on that, indeed, uh, at that time, around 2006 and uh, 2010, in that period, uh, people already know, uh, established the thing is that if you want to do uh, the possible word semantics, yeah. we, we try uh, ranking, uh, skyline, all those yeah. uh, different kinds of queries, as long as you can localize your yeah. query, it, it, essentially, you can uh, do, and you are only concerned about the top uh, something answer, yeah. then you can uh, uh, reduce the problem into uh, polynomial time. Uh, so it seems to me uh, the, uh, the rule still uh, remains the same here in the game, right? Uh, as long as uh, when you do the KN, essentially is that you uh, refine your query into some local. So you don't need to uh, search the whole thing. And also you mentioned for the um, uh, challenge for the future work uh, that the uh, population, once we have to consider population, then we uh, sort of like fall yeah. into the uh, polynomial, <laughs> I mean, the exponential uh, world. So um, yeah, that, I, I guess that there could be some connections between them. Yeah. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the only reason Kenyan's number works is exactly because of locality, right? So, so, yeah. so, so I think the fundamental principle, uh, I mean, still like stays there because that is like really fundamental, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's actually the reason why some query in public sense are like like are safe, right? Some like some query are not, right? Like like because of that. Uh, so here's the same, right? For Kenyan's neighbor classifier. Uh, you have the same type of locality, right? But, but of course, like the like the algorithm will be different because of different algorithm, oh, yeah. right? Uh, but the principle stays the same, right? So and and also how to do the populational thing, uh, we have some thoughts on that, right? So maybe uh, one thing you can do is you can actually decouple this into two different components. You can have, yeah. Actually, I don't know how to deal with that. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that we can talk of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can talk offline. Uh, offline, uh, indeed, there uh, could be some uh, old tricks we may we may try. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, like like people used to do those aggregation thing, right? So, like, think, yeah. like like how do aggregation over this? And that's actually very cool, right? So, like, on on one hand, you could have one aggregation, right? To and then mm -hmm. you kind of try to weight the prediction of Kenya's neighbor. Right, so then on one hand you have those like uh, additive structure, right? So like which also and yeah, so I think there are actually two tricks that make that possible. One, when you have those additive structure that you can actually to say the order doesn't matter, right? So then the whole thing become p, right? So and then when you have really those strict locality, the whole thing become p, right? Uh, potentially you could combine these two, right? You could have one aggregation that is in p time to capture the population structure. On one hand you have Kenya's neighbor, and then you maybe multiply them, which also is in p, right? So that could work. Uh, I mean, that could give you a p-time algorithm, but I don't know whether it works or not. As, uh, but uh, yeah, but that's something that we are very excited to explore together with you uh, because you are actually at, like the expert in this domain, and uh, and uh, yeah, we are very very excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's connect uh, uh, offline about that. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Great. Hey, thank you, Jeff, for your question. So, uh, Yung Jun, you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, hi, sir. So, uh, thanks for the nice talk. My name is Yong Jun, and I'm a master student supervised by Tianzheng and Jianan. And uh, this thing work are uh, excellent and can work well with uh, general downstream machine learning models. Uh, however, to make the thing work practical, the computation of the metrics, for example, the entropy, heavily relies on the structure of the KNN classifier. Otherwise, the computation will 
take many hours. So uh, I want to know if you have a design algorithm uh, for other classifier, may you share your experience? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean, I mean, yes, right. So I mean, uh, because we settle down on this fundamental quantity, uh, it's very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we have this simple proxy model, right, to uh, to make that feasible. Uh, the thing we are currently working on is actually how to relax these two fundamental quantities, right? I mean, there are two different directions you can explore. You can start from heuristics, right? And then you can make that work in general case. Or you can start from the hardest one and you try to relax it, right? So we, so we happen to, to choose a second one and for no particular reason, actually, yeah. So one thing we are trying to do is try to understand how can we relax them, right? For example, if you are talking about entropy, right? So under some assumption, assuming that your surface is linear, right? So essentially the, the, the variance of gradient, right? Could be a good approximation of the entropy, right? So it's going to be entropy under some uh, approximation. If you take that view, you can have, for example, if you have a, like like an end-to-end -end differentiable pipeline, also the model, uh, you can actually compute that much easier than the entropy. So that we know. We don't know whether it works or not, uh, but that is actually one thing that we are exploring. So, and then the fundamental challenge is actually how can you make the pipeline fully differentiable, right? Which is another chunk of work, right? So it's not easy, but uh, there's hope, right? So on the other hand, uh, we will have the Shapley value and also the expected marginal improvement. Uh, of course, people are working on influence function, right? So that's like one thing that like, like Percy has, I think also Jianan has a paper, right? Like also on that on, in Sigma, uh, or very deep, I forget which conference, but it's just one of my favorite paper of the year, right? Uh, like about how to combine that, like, like also like with, uh, with polynomials, right? So just inspirational. So like, like, so there are all those like things that you can do to make the whole thing easier. Uh, and we believe down the road is going to be a combination of both, right? For, for, for some problem, when you are able to approximate that using Keynes number, which we know there are actually a lot of problems that you can use a proxy model, we believe you should do this fundamental quantity. On the other hand, if you really care about the last bit of accuracy, right? Uh, maybe there's some heuristics, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are positive that down the road in five or 10 years, people will do a combination of both. That's our belief. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for answer. I think the approximation and the other direction you mentioned is uh, excellent future work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Eugene. So any other questions? You can tap in the chat box directly. So maybe I, I can ask one question. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, missed that point. So what? So the definition of entropy is that you consider all possible words of the training data, and then you train all possible models, then you apply it to the let's say validation data, each type of the validation data, then you can control the entropy. Uh, I'm not sure, you, did you also consider the possible words of the validation data set? Because if the training data is noisy, it's very likely validation data is also noisy. And yeah. I'm not sure if you have considered that. You know, that so that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I have no idea how to deal with dirty validation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we are kind of assuming you have a clean validation. Um, which is a very strong assumption, right? So like in many cases, the validation also is dirty. Uh, and I have no idea how to deal with that. Uh, I believe that is going to make the whole thing uh, exponential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my belief. Yeah, even for Kenya's neighbor. Yeah. Okay. So maybe one thing you should do is you should really clean it up, clean the validation. I mean, I mean at the end of the day, it's always the, like the, like, like, like the trade-off Right, so maybe you should spend some effort to clean the validation and hopefully validation is, is, is sometimes smaller, right? Uh, you fully clean it um, and then you try to clean the much larger training set given that small clean validation site. Maybe that's one thing that you could do, but of course it's not always possible, right? So they are data sets that you are not able to clean, right? Uh, in that case, what, you, uh, what should you do? We have no idea, yeah. But another thing you could, ah, actually, I mean, and then you could do MCMC on validation, right? Uh, which is very ugly, right? So like given the dirty validation set, you can generate a whole bunch of samples. For each one of them, you use the P-time algorithm and then you aggregate. 
you could do that, uh, but it's, it should work, but uh, it's ugly, right? So, but uh, that's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So another follow up question. So let's say if you you are you can clean the validation set, you can yeah uh, train a model over the training data. Yeah. And but once you deploy the model, real world data is actually dirty. So yeah. which means that you cannot have the Oracle to help you to clean the, let's say yeah. the serving data. So sometimes maybe it's better to have a model trained over the dirty data. And then yeah. that model can tolerate the error in the, uh, in, in practice rather than uh, fully clean the training data and then train yeah. train. I'm not sure if you have thoughts on that. Should we always try to clean the whole data perfectly? Or should we allow some noise so that we can the, the, the model we train can still yeah. tolerate some noise in, in practice? Oh yeah, so that's a very good question. Yeah. So uh we we don't have anything theoretical there. Uh we have one page like like one one benchmark uh in ICD, right, together with our friend Georgia Tech. Like to really try to understand uh different scenarios there. And I, exactly as you said, right? So when you can do nothing on your uh like uh, like during inference time right uh when you have dirty uh data in the inference time you shouldn't i mean in many cases you shouldn't clean your data right so you should force your input data uh to be the same distribution as your uh like uh, test data right so but also like i would argue in that case it's not really dirty anymore right so dirty means that I mean, it not means that I mean, dirty is essentially you have different distribution between training and testing, right? So that's why it's dirty, right? I mean, if they come from the same distribution, even though they are far from the ground truths, I would argue that's clean data, right? But, but, but that's semantics, right? That different way that you can call it. But again, like if you cannot clean the test data, uh, I think empirically you shouldn't clean the training data. Yeah. So and that I agree, and we observe that empirically over many cases. We actually have a benchmark paper about that. Um, yeah. So here our assumption is you are able to clean the test, but uh, you have a huge training set you want to clean. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, uh, is there any other question? Yeah, because I know it's very late. Uh, we are going to upload the video on YouTube. And also, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to contact to it directly. Uh, so maybe, uh, so let's let's thank to give such an excellent talk again. So we can give you some virtual applause. So thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. thank you so so much. Uh, particularly staying up for so late to give this <laughs> wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you everyone. So and and also we are going to have a couple of 